Good morning. It's good to be here. It's good to be here to, among God's people, to worship our God and our Savior. Our meditation verse is taken from John chapter 12. Jesus is speaking. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Let's prepare our hearts in worship. I want to welcome you all here. It's good to be here to worship as God's people, God's church. We are the church, not this building. And when we gather, God is here with us. And those who are joining us at home, uh, the alive streaming, we welcome you as you are also a part of God's people and God's church here to worship him this morning. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 108. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. 
Let's join together and sing a, a hymn of adoration to our God. Holy God, we praise your name, number 103 in your hymnal. Let's stand and sing. Let's pray to God in a prayer of adoration. Our God, we do praise and thank you. You alone are God. You alone are the creator of all things. And to you alone belongs all worship and praise and glory. Lord, we praise you for your love. We praise you for your grace. We praise you for your faithfulness, your truth. Lord, you are good. You are loving beyond our understanding and imagination. We praise you that you sent your own son into the world, that he came and gave up <clears throat> uh, what he had in heaven with you to become man and to go to a cross in our place that we might have life, that we might that we might know you, the living God, that you might open our eyes to the truth, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a mind to understand that these, this world we live in did not come by chance. It is your creation, and it speaks of your creation that you are the creator in, in so many ways. We praise you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for the revelation of your word. We thank you for the revelation of yourself in Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts this morning and allow us by your spirit to worship you, to draw close to you in faith, to lift up our praises to you that they would reach the, the courts of heaven as we sing your praise and glorify your name, believing in all that is true through Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask your blessing. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Our responsive reading comes from Psalm 127. 
We are continuing through the Psalter. And so let us read together God's Word. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Amen. Now we come to a prayer of confession. Let us hear from God's word our call to confession. And from Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's come to God in prayer. Lord, we come to you as those who do not know you as we ought, do not love you as we ought, do not serve you as we ought, <clears throat> do not believe in your word as we ought. But instead, we are too filled with our own thoughts, our own conclusions, our, our own understanding. We do not take our understanding from you and your word. We, we allow this world and, and its influence to affect our thoughts and affect our heart, make us cold and thoughtless. Lord, forgive us. We pray that you would forgive the way we go our way. We would, we would have life our way, seeking the things that promote ourselves, seeking the things that make us feel important, us feel respected by others. We look to others, not to you. We want to please others and not please you above all. Because Lord, we are sinners, and we confess that. There is no good thing in us. But you, Lord, you love. You love even us. And you have granted us a place in heaven in Christ. We praise and thank you that you forgive us the way we go our own way and we do not seek your way your will, your glory. Lord, we thank you that you promise that if we confess our sins and that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, we claim this promise and we come to you confessing and claiming the forgiveness we have in Jesus and seeking your spirit to lift our hearts up to you. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We have a hymn of assurance. Come, thou fount of every blessing. Hymn number 457. Let's stand and sing.
you. Please be seated. This morning, uh, we come to a, a rather short passage in the Gospel of John, John chapter 2, verses 23 through 35. This is God's word. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now let's come to God in a in corporate prayer, to prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Let's pray. Lord, we, we come to you amazed that you love us. Um, we take your name, and, and yet, Lord, uh, there are times when we uh, forget who we are. We forget that we are your people, and we, we live as if we weren't. And, and you know what our heart is like. You knew what the heart of the J Jewish people were like. You didn't trust yourself to them. You knew what they would do. Some years later, when they called for your death, though they claimed to believe in your name, it's... it's Amazing how far sin goes and what sin can do. And yet you love sinners. We praise you. We praise you for your salvation. We praise you that, that you are a God to be praised. And you've given us the, the message of, of truth about who you are and who Jesus Christ is and what happened on the cross, and what happened shortly after when you rose from the dead, and that you live and reign in heaven. Lord, we, we thank you for the gospel. And we pray that your word of truth would go out in power. And Lord, we, we thank you for those we support that are serving you in other, other lands, and we ask your blessing on them. We remember Gary and Anita and their service in Belize as they lead ministries there. And we ask that you would continue to bless. Thank you for how you are building your church even at this time and that many are coming to believe in you. We praise you that your gospel is, is not, is not uh, kept closed and shut up as so many uh, of us may feel. And we thank and praise you. And we ask that you would bless uh, those who serve. We pray your blessing on John and, and as he works with the church in, there in Belize and ask that you would bless him and bless that church and bless the marriages there. We pray for Ernest in Belize City that you'd bless him and his wife and bless especially Carolyn with, good, with, with health and strength and, and bless Ernest in his preaching as he, as he uh, preaches many times uh, in a day um, and pray that you would also bless Bethany Presbyterian Church there and, and thank you for your, your people that are worshiping you there. Um, encourage and strengthen them. We pray that you would, would be with um, Dan and, and Dale uh, as they, they lead the International Exchange Organization Ministry and we pray that you'd particularly help them at this time as they are, are still recovering from COVID that um, they fell sick to this past February, early in February. We ask that you would raise them up and, and bless them and bless their ministry. 
Lord, we pray for your blessing on, our, our, on your people here who are not with us, who can't be with us for health reasons. We ask that you, you would be with them and give them strength of body and mind and spirit. We pray especially for Sharon and Tom. We pray also for Delore and Artis. Um, and we pray for those who, um, especially those who are still grieving the loss of loved ones. Um, we ask that you would comfort them and strengthen their hearts. Um, be close and near to them. And we thank you for the hope that we have in you. And we ask that you would um, build them up in their faith. That we might all come together and worship you with one heart and spirit. Lord, we ask that you would also raise up uh, Faye as she is still, um, although recovering, uh, still in need of oxygen. And we pray that you would continue to bless her recovery. Lord, we ask that you would uh, be kind and gracious to our church. Thank you for how you have provided for us. And thank you for our officers. And we ask your blessing on them and their, and their families. We pray you give them wisdom and, and pray that they would lead well and serve well. And Lord, we ask that you would also uh, bless each family. We pray for the, your blessing on parents, especially um, with their children as they seek to raise them in, in the faith. And we pray that you would uh, encourage and, inst and strengthen each one. Thank you, Lord, for being our Father. Thank you for being always true, always loving, always seeking our good. We thank you that, that you lead us in, in truth and faithfulness and, and love and in, in, every, in every way. We ask your blessing now as we continue in our worship and we thank you. Through Jesus, amen. Let us come now and, and sing a, a song of praise to our God, uh, the doxology. Let's stand and sing. Please be seated. We are continuing in the, our series on the uh, Sermon on the Mount as we're going through the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus has been teaching about the righteousness, true righteousness that God seeks to find in his people. But do you ever find that you get tired of hearing about what you must do to be righteous or what you must do to be a good person or what you must do to be a loving person do you ever find that you are tired of hearing all this from God's law as it is preached to you. I have to confess, I do sometimes. But the problem, of course, is not with God's law or God's word. The problem is with me. It's with my heart. At these times when I feel tired as I hear and read God's law, what I hear is that I'm not keeping God's law. 
and I wish I were. I hear an accusation that I'm not measuring up. I hear that I am not what I want to be, that I'm not righteous. And I get tired of hearing that because I want to believe that I am righteous and that I am good. And if when I read God's word on my own, Ooh, and I find that I'm, I'm feeling this way, feeling tired of reading God's word, <laughs> then I know that I, I have a problem. At least I should. It should be like an alarm going off in my soul, telling me that something is wrong, something is terribly wrong with the state of my soul. Reading God's word should, should, not be, should not feel like a, a tiresome chore. It should feel like the water of life and the bread of life being poured into my soul, into a hungry and thirsty soul. Well, I share this because this morning we come to a text that, can, that, we, that we can easily hear as an accusation. Jesus is bringing to a conclusion his exposition on the righteousness that is required in order for a person to enter the kingdom of God. In this text, he is summing up what we need to do to have eternal life. He is telling us what God requires of us. And to be blunt, it is impossible for us to achieve. We cannot measure up to this standard of righteousness. And for this reason, if our heart is not in the right place, we will feel as we come to deal with this text that we are facing another tiresome chore. However, if in hearing these words that Jesus spoke, all that we hear is, that, is what God requires of us, then we will have taken this scripture out of context. <laughs> we have, will have forgotten that it's right there in the gospel, the good news that Matthew is sharing. Because the one who speaks these words is the one whose name is, according to John 1.36, the Lamb of God. So now let us read our text in John chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. And Jesus is the one speaking. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you sent him and that he came as the one who speaks truth. And we thank you that he had these Apostles with him, these 
12 disciples listening to him teach and that your spirit brought back to their remembrance all that he said and we have it recorded for us here. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for who you are revealed in Jesus. That Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We thank you for who you are. And we ask that you would bless us as we come to your word, that we might live our lives believing, trusting, and finding our real life is in Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen. But Jesus is speaking to the Jews who wanted to believe that they had the righteousness set forth in the law of God. And that they had God's favor because they were law keepers. And as a result, when they faced the command in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 that you are to love your enemies as yourselves it became very important to them to define who qualified as your neighbor in order to justify themselves they reasoned that there were certain people who could be called a neighbor and certain people who could be called not a neighbor and certainly the Amalekites would be one of those who would not be considered a neighbor. Not after what God said about them when they attacked the Israelites in the wilderness during the days of Moses. So the Jews reasoned that there were those who were neighbors and there were those who were enemies. And although you were commanded to love your neighbor, that did not mean that you did not have to, uh, that, that you could not hate your enemy. What the Jews failed to recognize was that they had, throughout their history, broken God's covenant by worshiping idols and living as the enemies of God themselves. And yet God had continued to forgive them and love them. The Jews the further believed that they could gain an inheritance in the kingdom of God through the righteousness that they achieved in keeping the law. The Jews also understood the principle of inheritance found in God's law, that those who inherit are the sons. According to, accordingly, those Jews who kept the righteousness of the law would be considered by God to be like sons to him. And being so received as sons, they would have also a, a, a place, an inheritance in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus shocked the Jews when he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Because the Jews heard, them, heard him say that this is how they would achieve the righteousness, righteousness that they needed to be considered as sons and become heirs in God's kingdom. In this way, Jesus was telling them, really, that love is the fulfillment of the law. And it reminds us of the answer that Jesus gave when asked what is the first and great commandment of the law. That you are to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and you are to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, it became clear Jesus is really teaching here what it means to love your neighbor 
when your neighbor lives as your enemy. In this passage, Jesus explains that it's not enough to love your neighbor with our kind of love, but rather we must love our neighbor with the love of God. The love of God is a peculiar love, a particular kind of love. It is a love that has its own shape and character, just as the love found in man has its own shape and character. Jesus descri describes the, the love found in man in verses 46 and 47. It is the love that you have for your friends. The ones who uh, you know, uh, and you know who your friends are, they're the ones who love you in return. <laughs> you do good to them because they do good to you. Right? And as Jesus points out, even sinners like tax collectors who had a, you know, joined with the Romans in collecting taxes from the Jews, even tax collectors have these kind of friends and this kind of love. People also have a love for their neighbor that extends to others who are like them and can be considered as part of their community, the same community. This is what was meant by the term brothers. When the Jews heard the term brothers, they heard fellow Israelites. Well, in the same way, Philistines would consider other Philistines brothers, and Egyptians would consider other Egyptians brothers. And such people classified as brothers would be all those who would greet one another on the basis of sharing a common heritage. And so we might call this the love shared between acquaintances. And it's similar to the love shared between friends, except perhaps it places fewer demands on us. But this kind of love does not come close to describing the shape and character of God's love. Because God loves even his enemies. And even the natural world reveals this truth about God, as Jesus explains in verse 45, about how God sends his Son to shine on the good and the evil, and rain upon the just and the unjust. And since God loves his enemies, if this is true about God, well, we are to be like him in the way we love. After all, we were created to bear his image. Since love is the fulfillment of the law, if we are to have the righteousness of God required in the kingdom of God, we must also have the love of God in our hearts. We must love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, just as Jesus said. Well, certainly Jesus revealed this love in his life. Did he not pray as he was crucified by Roman soldiers? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's in Luke 23, verse 34. And did he not love his enemies by dying in, his, in their place for their sins so that we all might live. In Romans 5.5, 5, Paul tells us that the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And then in the verses that follow, he tells us what this love of God is like. That God shows his love for us 
in that Christ died for us while we were ungodly. While we were still sinners. While we were his enemies. In a few short verses, that's how God describes us. This is the love of God. The Son of God dying on a cross so that his enemies would be saved and would live with him forever. And this is what God's love is like, and it is not at all like the love found in man. And yet, as our text makes clear, we must love the way God loves, we must love even our enemies if we are to have the righteousness that we need to gain life in heaven. And what is more, it is not enough for us to love our enemies on occasion. You know, maybe make some special ex exertion to do something loving once or twice or three times. Nor is it enough for us to love our enemies grudgingly No, we must love them perfectly. <laughs> we do not even come close to loving our friends, our parents, our spouses, and even our children as we should. Too often we can be thoughtless, neglectful, self-centered, irritable, impatient, angry, and even deceitful with those closest to us. If we cannot even love our friends, how can we hope to love our enemies as we should? To love them perfectly the way God does? Well, we can't. It's impossible. And yet, this is the righteousness that we need to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus is saying to the Jews. And this is what he's saying to us. We must be perfect in love as God is perfect in love. Jesus said something similar to the rich young man who came to him and asked him, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And after hearing the young man tell him that he had kept the commandments of the law from his youth, Jesus said to him in Matthew 19, verse 21, If you would be perfect, yeah, perfect. If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess Give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. The phrase, what you possess, is a phrase that means everything. It means all that you have. And, and Mark and Luke include the word all. So all that you possess. Just to make sure that they're readers understand this. It was not just his livestock, crops, and money that he owned that he was to give up. It was everything. House, land, and all that he had. And really, when he told the young man what he must do, Jesus was simply describing what Jesus himself was doing for that young man. And for us all. Jesus was giving up everything in order to give it all to us. In order that we who are truly poor would be made rich. In Philippians chapter 2 verse, verses 5 through 8 Paul says this and I'm reading from the New American Standard. I think it captures the meaning better. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus emptied himself and gave up all that he had, even his own life as a man, in order to pay the price of our redemption so that we would be made rich. And in telling that young man what he must do for the poor, Jesus was really pointing to what he was doing for him and for sinners like him so that we would be saved. And furthermore, when Jesus speaks about having treasure in heaven to that young man, we understand from the parables of the lost coin and the lost sheep that we are tr the treasure for Christ. We are that treasure. Wow. Is that how you think of yourself? God's treasure? It says something about his love, doesn't it? This light on the real message, th this, this sheds light on the real message, this understanding. It comes from this uh, other, other occasion. On the, on the real message in this, the words, you must therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And I'm taking some liberties here, but let me, let me, let me put it this way. Jesus was saying when he said those words, I have come. I am the one you need. I have come to be what you cannot be so that I, I may give you what you do not possess. I am the one who loves just as your Father in heaven loves. I am perfect just as our Heavenly Father is perfect. I, am, I have the righteousness of God that you need and it is yours if only you will believe in me as the Son of God, your Savior, your Lord, your God. In me, you will find forgiveness, cleansing, and the righteousness you need, but you do not have in yourselves. I am the one who loves you, the sinner. Believe in me, and you will inherit eternal life. The Jews did not understand that this is what Jesus was saying to them. Because they did not understand the truth of what John the Baptist proclaimed when he saw Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was there living among them as the Lamb of God. He was living among them as their substitute, soon to become their sacrifice. He was and still is their salvation and ours. Jesus is still in the business of saving people from their sins, especially in the lives of believers. When we believe in Christ, Christ gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit so that he lives in us and lives through us. And we live in him and live through him. As Romans 5.5 5 says, the Holy Spirit is pouring the love of God into our hearts. In other words, he is pouring the life of Christ into our hearts. 
This is his ministry and work in our lives. Only we must believe to receive Christ as we should and be transformed so that we become the channels of his love. That's, that's all that we, we're, God calls us to be channels. We're, we're the branches through which the vine, the sap of the vine flows. We're the members through which the love of the head, the Christ flows. We're channels. And as we, as we believe and love one another as Christ loved us and do good even to our enemies, as we believe and, and live with Christ in us and through us, then it will become evident to the world that Christ is among us and that he truly lives just as God's word testifies. And, and God will receive the glory for these things are only possible as we die to ourselves and let Christ live and love through us by faith. God will receive the glory as we live as his sons and daughters, loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us through the love of Christ filling our hearts. Let's pray. Lord, help us in our unbelief. Help us to believe that you love us this way. Help us to believe that you live in us this way as the one who loves us, as the one who sees us as your treasure, who delights in who we are, even though we know what sinners we are. You see us so much differently. You know us for our sins. You know that's true. And yet you cleanse, forgive, and are remaking us. And one day when you come, you're going to finish what you've begun and give us a body like yours and a nature like yours. You're going to finish what you've started, but you've started it now. And you, you called us when we were still enemies. You called us when we were still ungodly. You called us when we were lost in sin to belong to you because you, Lord, are love. Help us, Lord, to believe and to receive you into our hearts and to be filled with your love that we might love others with the love we've received from you. We ask this for your own glory, that you would be glorified and that we would be of service to you. We pray in your name. Amen. Let's continue in our, our worship as we sing a hymn, number 580. Lead on, O King Eternal. Let's stand.
let's continue in singing songs of praise. His mercy is more. And we'll follow that with leaning on the everlasting arms. on the everlasting arms. Let's sing.
Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.